prefatory note and chapter one of memoirs of madame vigée lebrun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigée Lebrun by Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Prefatory Note. Madame Lebrun brought out her memoirs at the suggestion of her friend, the Princess Dolgoruki, in 1835. The authoress was born in 1756 at Paris, where she died in 1842. She was the daughter of Louis Viget, an obscure portrait painter. Her baptismal name was Marie-Louise Elizabeth. In 1776, Mademoiselle Viget was married to Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun, a notable picture dealer and critic known also to his contemporaries as an inveterate gambler. This book forms a rendering of Madame Corette's edition of the Lebrun Memoirs, slightly abridged for the sake of uniformity with the memoirs of the Comtesse Potaka and the memoirs of a contemporary, issuing from the same hands as the present volume. Chapter 1. Youth I will begin by speaking of my childhood, which is the symbol, so to say, of my whole life, since my love for painting declared itself in my earliest youth. I was sent to a boarding school at the age of six, and remained there until I was eleven. During that time I scrawled on everything at all seasons. My copy-books, and even my schoolmates, I decorated with marginal drawings of heads, some full-face, others in profile. On the walls of the dormitory I drew faces and landscapes with colored chalks, so it may easily be imagined how often I was condemned to bread and water. I made use of my leisure moments outdoors in tracing any figures on the ground that happened to come into my head. At seven or eight, I remember, I made a picture by lamplight of a man with a beard, which I have kept until this very day. When my father saw it, he went into transports of joy, exclaiming, You will be a painter, child, if ever there was one. I mentioned these facts to show what an inborn passion for the art I possessed nor has that passion ever diminished. It seems to me that it has even gone on growing with time, for today I feel under the spell of it as much as ever, and shall, I hope, until the hour of death. It is indeed to this divine passion that I owe not only my fortune, but my felicity, because it has always been the means of bringing me together with the most delightful and most distinguished men and women in Europe. The recollection of all the notable people I have known often cheers me in times of solitude. As a schoolgirl, my health was frail, and therefore my parents would frequently come for me to take me to spend a few days with them. This, of course, suited my taste exactly. My father, Louis Viget, made very good pastel drawings. He did some which would have been worthy of the famous Latour, my father allowed me to do some heads in that style, and, in fact, let me mess with his crayons all day. He was so wrapped up in his art that he occasionally did queer things from sheer absent-mindedness. I remember how, one day, after dressing for a dinner in town, he went out and almost immediately came back, it having occurred to him that he would like to touch up a picture recently begun. He removed his wig, put on a nightcap, and went out again in this headgear, with his gilt-frog coat, his sword, etc. Had not one of his neighbors stopped him, he would have exhibited himself in this costume all through the town. He was a very witty man. His natural good spirits infected everyone, and some came to be painted by him for the sake of his amusing conversation. Once, when he was making a portrait of a rather pretty woman, my father observed, while he worked at her mouth, that she made all manner of grimaces, in order to make that organ look smaller. Falling out of patience with all this maneuvering, my father quietly remarked, Please, don't let me give you so much trouble. You have only to say the word and I will paint you without a mouth. My mother was an extremely handsome woman. This may be judged from the pastel portrait made of her by my father, as well as from my own oil painting of a much later date. 
she carried her goodness to austerity and my father worshipped her as though she had been divine she was very pious and in heart i was so too we always heard high mass together and were regular attendants at the other church services especially in lent did we never omit any of the prescribed devotions evening prayer not accepted i have always liked sacred singing and in those days organ music would often move me to tears my father was in the habit of inviting various artists and men of letters to his house of an evening at the head of them i must place doyen the historical painter my father's most intimate and my first friend doyen was the nicest man in the world so clever and so good his views on persons and things were always exceedingly just and moreover he talked about painting with such fervent enthusiasm that it made my heart beat fast to listen to him poinsonnet was very clever too and gay perhaps his extraordinary credulity is generally known as a consequence of it he was continually made game of in the most unheard-of ways some friends once told him that there was an office called the king's screen and persuaded him to stand before a blazing fire so hot that it nearly roasted his calves when he attempted to move away he was told he must not stir but that he must accustom himself to intense heat or he would not get the post poinsonnet was however far from being a fool many of his works are still in favor and he is the only author who ever gained three dramatic successes in one night ermeline at the grand opera the circle at the theatre francois tom jones at the opera comique someone put it into his head that he had a taste for travel so he began with spain and was drowned while crossing the Guadalquivir. i may also mention davaine painter and poet he was rather mediocre in both arts but was bidden to my father's suppers because of his witty conversation though nothing more than a child the jollity of these suppers was a great source of pleasure to me i was obliged to leave the table before dessert but from my room i heard the laughter and the joking and the songs these i confess i did not understand nevertheless they helped to make my holidays delightful at eleven i left the boarding-school for good after my first communion Devin, who painted in oils sent his wife for me to teach me how to mix colors their poverty grieved me deeply one day when i wanted to finish a head i had begun they made me remain to dinner the dinner consisted of soup and baked apples i was overjoyed at not having to leave my parents again my brother three years younger than i was as lovely as an angel i was not nearly so lively as he and far from being so clever or so pretty in fact at that time of my life i was very plain i had an enormous forehead and eyes far too deep set my nose was the only good feature of my pale skinny face besides i was growing so fast that i could not hold myself up straight and i bent like a willow these defects were the despair of my mother i fancy she had a weakness for my brother at any rate she spoiled him and forgave him his youthful sins whereas she was very severe toward myself to make up for it my father overwhelmed me with kindness and indulgence his tender love endeared him more and more to my heart and so my good father is ever present to me and i believe i have not forgotten a word he uttered in my hearing how often during seventeen eighty nine did i think of something in sort prophetic which he said he had come home from a philosopher's dinner where he had met diderot helvetius and d'alembert he was so thoroughly dejected that my mother asked him what the matter was all i have heard tonight, my dear he replied makes me believe that the world will soon be turned upside down i had spent one happy year at home when my father fell ill after two months of suffering all hope of his recovery was abandoned when he felt his last moments approaching he declared a wish to see my brother and myself we went close to his bedside weeping bitterly his face was terribly altered his eyes and his features usually so full of animation were quite without expression 
for the pallor and the chill of death were already upon him we took his icy hand and covered it with kisses and tears he made a last effort and sat up to give us his blessing be happy my children was all he said an hour later our poor father had ceased to live so heartbroken was i that it was long before i felt able to take to my crayons again doyen came to see us sometimes and as he had been my father's best friend his visits were a great consolation he it was who urged me to resume the occupation i loved and in which to speak truth i found the only solace for my woe it was then that i began to paint from nature i accomplished several portraits pastels and oils i also drew from nature and from casts often working by lamplight with mademoiselle bouquet with whom i was closely acquainted i went to her house in the evenings she lived in the rue saint denis where her father had a bric-a-brac shop it was a long way off since we lodged in the rue de clary opposite the Loubert mansion my mother therefore insisted on my being escorted whenever i went we likewise frequently repaired mademoiselle bouquet and i to briard's a painter who lent us his etchings and his classical busts briard was but a moderate painter although he did some ceilings of rather unusual conception on the other hand he could draw admirably which was the reason why several young people went to him for lessons his rooms were in the louvre and each of us brought her little dinner carried in a basket by a nurse in order that we might make a long day of it mademoiselle bouquet was fifteen years old and i fourteen we were rival beauties i had changed completely and had become good-looking her artistic abilities were considerable as for mine i made such speedy progress that soon i was talked about and this resulted in my making the gratifying acquaintance of joseph vernet that famous painter gave me cordial encouragement and much invaluable advice i also got to know the abbe arnaud of the french academy he was a man of strong imaginative gifts with a passion for literature and the arts his conversation enriched me with ideas if i may thus express myself he would talk of music and painting with the most inspiring ardor the abbey was a warm partisan of gluck and at a later date brought the great composer to see me for i too was passionately fond of music my mother was now proud of my face and figure i was growing stouter and presented the fresh appearance proper to youth on sundays she took me to the tuileries she was still handsome herself and after the lapse of all these years i am free to confess that the manner in which we were so often followed by men embarrassed more than it flattered me seeing me so irremediably affected by our cruel loss my mother deemed it best to take me out of myself by showing me pictures thus we went to the luxembourg palace the gallery of which then contained some of rubens masterpieces as well as numerous works by the greatest painters at present nothing is to be seen there but pictures of the modern french school i am the only painter of that class not represented the old masters have since been removed to the louvre rubens has lost much by the change the difference between well or badly lighted pictures is the same as between well or badly played pieces of music we also saw some rich private collections none of which however equaled that of the palais royal made by the regent and containing a conspicuous number of old italian masters as soon as i entered one of these galleries i at once became exactly like a bee so much useful knowledge did i eagerly gather while intoxicated with bliss in the contemplation of the great masters besides in order to improve myself i copied some of the pictures of rubens some of rembrandt's and van dyck's heads as well as several heads of girls by grus because these last were a good lesson to me in the demi-tints to be found in delicate flesh coloring van dyck shows them also but more finely it is to these studies that i owe my improvement in the very important science of degradation of light on the salient parts of a head so admirably done by raphael 
whose heads it is true combine all the perfections but it is only in rome under the bright italian sky that raphael can be properly judged when after years i was enabled to see some of his masterpieces which had never left their native home i recognized raphael to be above his high renown my father had left us penniless but i was earning a deal of money as i was already painting many portraits this however was insufficient for household expenses seeing that in addition i had to pay for my brother's schooling his clothes his books and so on my mother therefore saw herself obliged to remarry she took a rich jeweller whom we never had suspected of avarice but who directly after the marriage displayed his stinginess by limiting us to the absolute necessities of life although i was good-natured enough to hand him over everything i earned joseph vernet was greatly enraged he counseled me to grant an annuity and to keep the rest for myself but i did not comply with this advice i was afraid my mother might suffer in consequence with such a skinflint i detested the man the more as he had appropriated my father's wardrobe and wore all the clothes just as they were without having them altered to fit him my young reputation attracted a number of strangers to our house several distinguished personages came to see me among them the notorious count orloff one of peter the third's assassins count orloff was a giant in stature and i remember his wearing a diamond of enormous size and a ring about this time i painted a portrait of count chauvelin grand chamberlain then i believe about sixty years old he combined amiability with perfect manners and as he was an excellent man was sought after by the best company one of my visitors of eminence was madame joffrine the woman so famous for her brilliant social life madame joffrine gathered at her house all the known men of talent in literature and the arts all foreigners of note and the grandest gentlemen attached to the court being neither of good family nor endowed with unusual abilities nor even possessing much money she had nevertheless made a position for herself in paris unique of its kind and one that no woman could nowadays hope to achieve having heard me spoken of she came to see me one morning and said the most flattering things about my person and my gifts although she was not very old i should have put her down for a hundred for not only was she rather bent but her dress gave her an aged appearance she was clad in an iron-gray gown and on her head wore a large winged cap over which was a black shawl knotted under her chin at present on the other hand women of her years succeeded in making themselves look much younger by the care they bestow on their toilette immediately after my mother's marriage we went to live at my stepfather's in the rue saint honore opposite the terrace of the palais royal which terrace our windows overlooked i often saw the duchess de chartres walking in the garden with her ladies-in-waiting and soon observed that she noticed me with kindly interest i had recently finished a portrait of my mother which evoked a great deal of discussion at the time the duchess sent for me to come and paint her she most obligingly commended my young talents to her friends so that it was not long before i received a visit from the stately handsome countess de brion and her lovely daughter the princess de Laurent who were followed by all the great ladies of the court and the faubourg saint germain since i have acknowledged that i was stared at in the streets the same is true of the theatres and other public places and that i was the object of many attentions it may readily be guessed that some admirers of my face gave me commissions to paint theirs they hoped to get into my good graces in this way but i was so absorbed in my art that nothing could take me away from it then besides the moral and religious principles my mother had instilled me with were a strong protection against the seductions surrounding me happily i never as yet had read a single novel the first i read clarissa harlowe was only after my marriage and it interested me prodigiously before my marriage i read nothing but sacred literature such as the moral precepts of the holy fathers which contained everything one needs to know 
and some of my brother's class books to return to those gentlemen as soon as i observed any intention on their part of making sheep's eyes at me i would paint them looking in another direction than mine and then at the least movement of the pupilla would say i am doing the eyes now this vexed them a little of course but my mother who was always present and whom i had taken into my confidence was secretly amused on sundays and saints days after hearing high mass my mother and my stepfather took me to the palais royal for a walk the gardens were then far more spacious and beautiful than they are now strangled and straightened by the houses enclosing them there was a very broad and long avenue on the left arched by gigantic trees which formed a vault impenetrable to the rays of the sun there good society assembled in its best clothes the opera house was hard by the palace in the summer the performance ended at half past eight and all elegant people left even before it was over in order to ramble in the garden it was the fashion for the women to wear huge nosegays which added to the perfumed powder sprinkled in everybody's hair really made the air one breathed quite fragrant later yet still before the revolution i have known these assemblies to last until two in the morning there was music by moonlight out in the open artists and amateurs sang songs there was playing on the harp and the guitar the celebrated saint george often executed pieces on his violin crowds flocked to the spot we never entered this avenue mademoiselle bouquet and i without attracting lively attention we both were then between sixteen and seventeen years old mademoiselle bouquet being a great beauty at nineteen she was taken with the smallpox which called forth such general interest that numbers from all classes of society made anxious inquiries and a string of carriages was constantly drawn up outside her door she had a remarkable talent for painting but she gave up the pursuit almost immediately after her marriage with monsieur Fillul, when the queen made her gatekeeper of the castle of la mouette would that i could speak of the dear creature without calling her dreadful end to mind alas how well i remember madame Fillul saying to me on the eve of my departure from france when i was to escape from the horrors i foresaw you are wrong to go i intend to stay because i believe in the happiness the revolution is to bring us and that revolution took her to the scaffold before she quitted la mouette the terror had begun madame chalgrin a daughter of joseph vernet and madame fiol's bosom friend came to the castle to celebrate her daughter's wedding quietly as a matter of course however the next day the jacobins none the less proceeded to arrest madame Fillul and madame chalgrin who they said had wasted the candles of the nation a few days later they were both guillotined among the favorite walks were the temple boulevards every day though especially on thursdays hundreds of vehicles drove or stood in the roads where the cafes and shows still are the young men on horseback caracoled about the carriages as they did at longchamps for longchamps was already in existence and even very brilliant the side paths were full of immense throngs of pedestrians enjoying the pastime of admiring or criticizing all the lovely ladies dressed in their best who passed in fine carriages at a certain spot where the cafe turc now stands a spectacle was to be seen which many a time made me burst into loud laughter it was a long row of old women belonging to the marais quarter sitting gravely on their chairs their faces so thickly rouged that they looked precisely like dolls as at that date the right to wear rouge was only conceded to women of high rank these worthy ladies thought they must take advantage of the privilege to its full limit one of our friends who knew most of them told us that their only employment at home was to play lotto from morning till night he also said that one day after he had returned from versailles some of them had asked him the news that he had replied monsieur de la perouse was to make a journey round the world and that the hostess had thereupon exclaimed gracious what a lot of time the man must have on his hands years later 
long after my marriage i saw various little shows on this very boulevard at one only did i attend often that was carlo perico's fantaccini which amused me vastly these marionettes were so cleverly made and their gestures were so natural that the delusion sometimes succeeded my little girl six years old almost did not at first suspect that the figures were not alive i informed her as to the truth and when soon after i took her to the comedie francois where my box was rather far from the stage she asked me and those mamma are they alive the Colosseum was another highly fashionable resort it was established in one of the large squares of the champs elysees in the form of a vast rotunda in the middle was a lake of clear water on which boatmen's races were held you strolled round about in broad gravelled avenues lined with benches at nightfall everyone left the garden to meet in a great hall where a full orchestra dispensed excellent music at this period there also was on the temple boulevard a place called the summer vauxhall whose garden was simply a big space for walking in bordered by covered tiers of seats for the convenience of good society people gathered there before dark in warm weather and the diversions of the day closed with a grand display of fireworks all these places were frequented much more than tivoli is to-day it is surprising too that the parisians who have nothing but the tuileries and the luxembourg should have renounced those other resorts which were half urban and half rural where you went in the evening to get a breath of air and eat ices end of prefatory note and chapter one recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Two of Memoirs of Madame Vigée Lebrun by Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun, translated by Lionel Strachey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter Two, Up the Ladder of Fame. My detestable stepfather, annoyed no doubt by the public admiration shown my mother forbade us to go for any more walks and informed us that he was about to take a place in the country at this announcement my heart beat with joy for i was passionately fond of the country i had been sleeping near the foot of my mother's bedstead in a dark corner where the light of day never penetrated every morning whatever the weather might be my first care was to open the window wide such was my thirst for fresh air so my stepfather took a small cottage at chalot and we went there on saturday spent sunday there and returned to paris on monday morning good heavens what a country imagine a tiny vicarage garden without a tree without any shelter from the blazing sun but a little arbor where my stepfather had planted some beans and nasturtium which refused to grow at that we only occupied a quarter of this delightful garden for it was divided into four by slender railings and the three other sections were let out to shop boys who came every sunday and amused themselves by shooting at the birds the incessant noise threw me into a desperate state of mind besides which i was terribly afraid of being killed by these marksmen so inaccurate was their aim i could not understand why this stupid ugly place the very recollection of which makes me yawn as i write was the country at last my good angel brought to my rescue a friend of my mother's who one day came to dine with us at chalot with her husband both were sorry for me in my exile and sometimes took me out for a charming drive we went to marly le roy and there i found a more beautiful spot than any i had seen in my life on each side of the magnificent palace were six summer houses communicating with one another by walks embowered with jessamine and honeysuckle water fell in cascades from the top of a hill behind the castle and formed a large channel on which a number of swans floated the handsome trees the carpets of green the flowers the fountains one of which spouted up so high that it was lost from sight it was all grand all regal it all spoke of louis the fourteenth 
one morning i met queen marie antoinette walking in the park with several of the ladies of her court they were all in white dresses and so young and pretty that for a moment i thought it was in a dream i was with my mother and was turning away when the queen was kind enough to stop me and invited me to continue in any direction i might prefer alas when i returned to france in eighteen o two i hastened to see my noble smiling marly the palace the trees the cascades and the fountains had all disappeared scarcely a stone was left i found it very hard to quit those lovely gardens and go back to our hideous chalot but we at last went back to paris and settled there for the winter the time left over from my work i now spent in a most agreeable manner from the age of fifteen i had been going out into the best society and i knew all the celebrated artists so that i received invitations from all sides i very well remember the first time i dined in town with the sculptor lamoine who was then enjoying a great reputation it was there i met the famous actor le Cain, who struck terror into my heart because of his wild and sinister appearance his huge eyebrows only added to the fierce expression of his face he scarcely talked at all and ate enormously at lemoyne's i made the acquaintance of gerbier the noted advocate and of his daughter madame de roissy who was very beautiful and one of the first women i made a portrait of gretry and latour an eminent pastelist often came to these dinners at lemoyne's which were highly convivial and amusing it was then the custom to sing at dessert when the turn of the young ladies came to whom i must admit this custom was torture they would turn pale and tremble all over and consequently often sing very much out of tune in spite of these dissonances the dinners ended pleasantly and we always rose from the table with regret although we did not immediately order our carriages as the fashion is to-day i cannot however speak of the dinners of the present day except through hearsay in view of the fact that soon after the time i have just mentioned i stopped dining in town for good a slight adventure i had made me determine to go out only in the evening i had accepted an invitation to dine with princess rohan roquefort all dressed and ready to get into my carriage i was seized with a sudden desire to take a look at a portrait that i had begun that same morning i had on a white satin dress which i was wearing for the first time i sat down on my chair opposite my easel without noticing that my palette was lying on the chair it may readily be conceived that the state of my gown was such as to compel me to remain at home and i resolved thenceforth to accept no invitations excepting to supper the dinners of princess rohan roquefort were delightful the nucleus of the society was composed of the handsome comtesse de brion and her daughter the princess laurent the duc de choiseul the cardinal de rohan and monsieur de rouliere the author of the disputes but the most agreeable without question of all the guests was the duc de lausun no one could possibly have been cleverer or more entertaining we were all fascinated by him the evening was usually filled up with playing and singing and i often sang to my own accompaniment on the guitar supper was at half past ten we were never more than ten or twelve at a table we all vied with one another in sociability and wit as for me i was only a humble listener and although too young to appreciate the qualities of this conversation to the full it spoiled me for ordinary conversation my life as a young girl was very unusual not only did my talent feeble as it seemed to me when i thought of the great masters cause me to be sought after and welcomed by society but i sometimes was the object of attentions which i might call public and of which i avow i was very proud for example i made portraits of cardinal fleury and la bruyere copied from engravings of ancient date i made a gift of them to the french academy which sent me a very flattering letter through the permanent secretary de lambert my presentation of these two portraits to the academy also secured me the honor of a visit from de lambert 
a dried-up morsel of a man of exquisitely polished manners he stayed a long time and looked my study all over while he paid me a thousand compliments after he had gone a fine lady who happened to be visiting me at the same time asked me whether i had painted la bruyere and fleury from life i am a little too young for that i answered unable to refrain from a laugh but very glad for the sake of the lady that the academician had left before she put her funny question my stepfather having retired from business we took up residence at the loubert mansion in the rue de clary monsieur lebrun had just bought the house and lived there himself and as soon as we were settled in it i began to examine the splendid masterpieces of all schools with which his lodgings were filled i was enchanted at an opportunity of first-hand acquaintance with these works by great masters m lebrun was so obliging as to lend me for purposes of copying some of his handsomest and most valuable paintings thus i owed him the best lessons i could conceivably have obtained when after a lapse of six months he asked my hand in marriage i was far from wishing to become his wife though he was very well built and had a pleasant face i was then twenty years old and was living without anxiety as to the future since i was already earning a deal of money so that i felt no manner of inclination for matrimony but my mother who believed m lebrun to be very rich incessantly plied me with arguments in favour of accepting such an advantageous match at last i decided in the affirmative urged especially by the desire to escape from the torture of living with my stepfather whose bad temper had increased day by day since he had relinquished active pursuits so little however did i feel inclined to sacrifice my liberty that even on my way to church i kept saying to myself shall i say yes or shall i say no alas i said yes and in so doing exchanged present troubles for others not that m lebrun was a cruel man his character exhibited a mixture of gentleness and liveliness he was extremely obliging to everybody and in a word quite an agreeable person but his furious passion for gambling was at the bottom of the ruin of his fortune and my own of which he had the entire disposal so that in seventeen eighty nine when i quitted france i had not an income of twenty francs although i had earned more than a million he had squandered it all my marriage was kept secret for some time m lebrun who was supposed to marry the daughter of a dutchman with whom he did a great business in pictures asked me to make no announcement until he had wound up his affairs to this i consented the more willingly that i did not give up my maiden name without regret particularly as i was so well known by that name but the keeping of the secret which did not last long was nevertheless fraught with disastrous consequences for my future a number of people who simply believed that i was merely considering a match with m lebrun came to advise me to commit no such piece of folly albert the crown jeweller said to me in a friendly spirit it would be better for you to tie a stone to your neck and jump into the river than to marry lebrun another day the duchess de aremberg accompanied by madame de canillas and madame de Sousa, the portuguese ambassadress all very young and pretty came to offer their belated counsels a fortnight after the knot had been tied for heaven's sake exclaimed the countess on no account marry m lebrun you will be miserable if you do and then she told me a lot of things which i was happy enough to disbelieve but which only proved too true afterward the announcement of my marriage put an end to these sad warnings which thanks to my dear painting had little effect on my usual good spirits i could not meet the orders for portraits that were showered upon me from every side m lebrun soon got into the habit of pocketing my fees he also hit upon the idea of making me give lessons in order to increase our revenues i acceded to his wishes without a moment's thought the number of portraits i painted at this time was really prodigious as i detested the female style of dress then in fashion i bent all my efforts upon rendering it a little more picturesque 
and was delighted when after getting the confidence of my models i was able to drape them according to my fancy shawls were not yet worn but i made an arrangement with broad scarfs lightly intertwined round the body and on the arms which was an attempt to imitate the beautiful drapings of raphael and domenichino the picture of my daughter playing the guitar is an example besides i could not endure the powder i persuaded the handsome duchess de gramont caderousse to put none on for her sittings her hair was ebony black and i divided it on the forehead disposing it in irregular curls after the sitting which ended at the dinner hour the duchess would not change her headdress but go to the theatre as she was a woman of such good looks would of course set a fashion indeed this mode of doing the hair soon found imitators and then gradually became general this reminds me that in seventeen eighty six when i was painting the queen i begged her to use no powder and to part her hair on the forehead i should be the last to follow that fashion said the queen laughing i do not want people to say that i adopted it to hide my large forehead as i said i was overwhelmed with orders and was very much in vogue soon after my marriage i was present at a meeting of the french academy at which la harpe read his discourse on the talents of women when he arrived at certain lines of exaggerated praise which i was hearing for the first time and in which he extolled my art and likened my smile to that of venus the author of warwick threw a glance at me at once the whole assembly without excepting the duchess de chartres and the king of sweden who both were witnessing these ceremonies rose up turned in my direction and applauded with such enthusiasm that i almost fainted from confusion but these pleasures of gratified vanity were far from comparable with the joy i experienced in looking forward to motherhood i will not attempt to describe the transports i felt when i heard the first cry of my child every mother knows what those feelings are not long before that event i painted the duchess de mazarin who was no longer young but whose beauty had not yet faded this duchess de mazarin was said to have been endowed on her birth by three fairies wealth duty and ill luck certain it is that the poor woman could undertake nothing not even so much as entertaining a party of friends without some mishap befalling a number of tales of all sorts of untoward happenings were current here is one of the least known one evening having sixty people to supper she conceived the plan of putting on the table an enormous pie in which were imprisoned a hundred tiny living birds at a sign from the duchess the pie was opened and the whole fluttering flock beat their wings against the faces of the guests and took refuge in the hair of the women making nests of their elaborately built-up headdresses it may be imagined what consternation and excitement there was it was impossible to get rid of the unfortunate birds and at last the company was obliged to leave the table while they blessed such a silly trick the duchess de mazarin was very stout it took hours to lace her one day while she was being laced a visitor was announced one of her maids ran to the door and exclaimed you can't come in until we have arranged her meat i remember that this excessive corpulency evoked the admiration of the turkish ambassadors when asked at the opera to point out the woman that pleased them most of all the occupants of the boxes they pointed without hesitation to the duchess de mazarin because she was the fattest while speaking of ambassadors i must not forget to say how i once painted two diplomats who though they were copper-colored nevertheless had splendid heads in seventeen eighty eight some envoys were sent to paris by the emperor tipu sahib i saw these indians at the opera and they appeared to me so remarkably picturesque that i thought i should like to paint them but as they communicated to their interpreter that they would never allow themselves to be painted unless the request came from the king i managed to secure that favor from his majesty i repaired to the hotel where the strangers were lodging for they wanted to be painted at home on my arrival one of them brought in a jar of rose water with which he sprinkled my hands then the tallest whose name was davich khan 
gave me a sitting i did him standing with his hand on his dagger he threw himself into such an easy natural position of his own accord that i did not make him change it i let the paint dry in another room and began on the portrait of the old ambassador whom i represented seated with his son next to him the father especially had a magnificent head both were clad in flowing robes of white muslin worked with golden flowers and these robes a sort of long tunic with wide upturned sleeves were held in place by gorgeous belts madame de bonille to whom i had spoken of my artistic sittings very much wanted to see these ambassadors they invited us both to dinner and we accepted from sheer curiosity upon entering the dining-room we were rather surprised to see that the dinner was served on the floor which obliged us to assume an attitude that was very much like lying down following the example of our oriental hosts they helped us with their hands to the contents of the dishes in one of these was a fricassee of sheep's feet with white sauce highly spiced and in another some indescribable hash our meal was not exactly pleasant it was rather too much of a shock to us to see those brown hands used as spoons the ambassadors had brought a young man with them who spoke a little french during my sittings madame de bonille taught him to sing a popular ditty when we went to make our farewells the young man recited his song and expressed his regret in parting from us by adding ah my heart how it weepeth which i found very oriental and very well put when davich khan's portrait was dry i sent for it but he had hidden it behind his bed and would not give it up asserting that the picture still needed a soul i could only obtain my painting by employing strategy when the ambassador could not find it he put the responsibility on his valet and threatened to kill him the interpreter had all the trouble in the world to explain that it was not the custom to kill one's valet in paris and informed him moreover that the king of france had asked for the portrait it was in the year seventeen seventy nine that i painted the queen for the first time she was then in the heyday of her youth and beauty marie antoinette was tall and admirably built being somewhat stout but not excessively so her arms were superb her hands small and perfectly formed and her feet charming she had the best walk of any woman in france carrying her head erect with a dignity that stamped her queen in the midst of her whole court her majestic mane however not in the least diminishing the sweetness and amiability of her face to any one who has not seen the queen it is difficult to get an idea of all the graces and all the nobility combined in her person her features were not regular she had inherited that long narrow oval peculiar to the austrian nation her eyes were not large in color they were almost blue and they were at the same time merry and kind her nose was slender and pretty and her mouth not too large though her lips were rather thick but the most remarkable thing about her face was the splendor of her complexion i never have seen one so brilliant and brilliant is the word for her skin was so transparent that it bore no umber in the painting neither could i render the real effect of it as i wished i had no colors to paint such freshness such delicate tints which were hers alone and which i had never seen in any other woman at the first sitting the imposing air of the queen at first frightened me greatly but her majesty spoke to me so graciously that my fear was soon dissipated it was on that occasion that i began the picture representing her with a large basket wearing a satin dress and holding a rose in her hand this portrait was destined for her brother emperor joseph the second and the queen ordered two copies besides one for the empress of russia the other for her own apartments at versailles or fontainebleau i painted various pictures of the queen at different times in one i did her to the knees in a pale orange red dress standing before a table on which she was arranging some flowers in a vase it may be well imagined that i preferred to paint her in a plain gown and especially without a wide hoop skirt she usually gave these portraits to her friends or to foreign diplomatic envoys 
one of them shows her with a straw hat on and a white muslin dress whose sleeves are turned up though quite neatly when this work was exhibited at the salon malignant folk did not fail to make the remark that the queen had been painted in her chemise for we were then in seventeen eighty six and calumny was already busy concerning her yet in spite of all this the portraits were very successful toward the end of the exhibition a little piece was given at the vaudeville theatre bearing the title i think the assembling of the arts brognard the architect and his wife whom the author had taken into his confidence had taken a box on the first tier and called for me on the day of the first performance as i had no suspicion of the surprise in store for me judge of my emotion when painting appeared on the scene and i saw the actress representing that art copy me in the act of painting a portrait of the queen the same moment everybody in the parterre and the boxes turned toward me and applauded to bring the roof down i can hardly believe that any one was ever more moved and more grateful than i was that evening I was so fortunate as to be on very pleasant terms with the queen when she heard that i had something of a voice we rarely had a sitting without singing some duets by gretry together for she was exceedingly fond of music although she did not sing very true as for her conversation it would be difficult for me to convey all its charm all its affability i do not think that queen marie antoinette ever missed an opportunity of saying something pleasant to those who had the honor of being presented to her and the kindness she always bestowed upon me has ever been one of my sweetest memories one day i happened to miss the appointment she had given me for a sitting i had suddenly become unwell the next day i hastened to versailles to offer my excuses the queen was not expecting me she had had her horses harnessed to go out driving and her carriage was the first thing i saw on entering the palace yard I nevertheless went upstairs to speak with the chamberlains on duty. One of them, Monsieur Campin, received me with a stiff and haughty manner, and bellowed at me in his stentorian voice, It was yesterday, madame, that Her Majesty expected you, and I am very sure she is going out driving, and I am very sure she will give you no sitting today. Upon my reply that I had simply come to take Her Majesty's orders for another day, he went to the Queen, who at once had me conducted to her room. She was finishing her toilette and was holding a book in her hand, hearing her daughter repeat a lesson. My heart was beating violently, for I knew that I was in the wrong. But the Queen looked up at me and said most amiably, I was waiting for you all the morning yesterday. What happened to you? I am sorry to say, Your Majesty, I replied, I was so ill that I was unable to comply with Your Majesty's commands. I am here to receive more now, and then I will immediately retire. No, no, do not go, exclaimed the Queen. I do not want you to have made your journey for nothing. She revoked the order for her carriage and gave me a sitting. I remember that in my confusion and my eagerness to make a fitting response to her kind words, I opened my paint-box so excitedly that I spilled my brushes on the floor. I stooped down to pick them up. Never mind, never mind, said the queen. And for aught I could say, she insisted on gathering them all up herself. When the queen went for the last time to Fontainebleau, where the court, according to custom, was to appear in full gala, I repaired there to enjoy that spectacle. I saw the queen in her grandest dress she was covered with diamonds and as the brilliant sunshine fell upon her she seemed to me nothing short of dazzling her head erect on her beautiful greek neck lent her as she walked such an imposing such a majestic air that one seemed to see a goddess in the midst of her nymphs during the first sitting i had with her majesty after this occasion i took the liberty of mentioning the impression she had made upon me and of saying to the queen how the carriage of her head added to the nobility of her bearing she answered in a jesting tone if i were not queen they would say i looked insolent would they not the queen neglected nothing to impart to her children the courteous and gracious manners which endeared her so to all her surroundings i once saw her make her six-year-old daughter dine with a little peasant girl and attend to her wants 
the queen saw to it that the little visitor was served first saying to her daughter you must do the honours the last sitting i had with her majesty was given me at trianon where i did her hair for the large picture in which she appeared with her children after doing the queen's hair as well as separate studies of the dauphin madame royale and the duc de normandy i busied myself with my picture to which i attached great importance and i had it ready for the salon of seventeen eighty eight the frame which had been taken there alone was enough to evoke a thousand malicious remarks that's how the money goes they said and a number of other things which seemed to me the bitterest comments at last i sent my picture but i could not muster up the courage to follow it and find out what its fate was to be so afraid was i that it would be badly received by the public in fact i became quite ill with fright i shut myself in my room and there i was praying to the lord for the success of my royal family when my brother and a host of friends burst in to tell me that my picture had met with universal acclaim after the salon the king having had the picture transferred to versailles monsieur d'angevilliers then minister of the fine arts and director of royal residences presented me to his majesty louis the sixteenth vouchsafed to talk to me at some length and to tell me that he was very much pleased then he added still looking at my work i know nothing about painting but you make me like it the picture was placed in one of the rooms at versailles and the queen passed it going to mass and returning after the death of the dauphin which occurred early in the year seventeen eighty nine the sight of this picture reminded her so keenly of the cruel loss she had suffered that she could not go through the room without shedding tears she then ordered m d'angevilliers to have the picture taken away but with her usual consideration she informed me of the fact as well apprising me of her motive for the removal it is really to the queen's sensitiveness that i owed the preservation of my picture for the fishwives who soon afterward came to versailles for their majesties would certainly have destroyed it as they did the queen's bed which was ruthlessly torn apart i never had the felicity of setting eyes on marie antoinette after the last court ball at versailles the ball was given in the theatre and the box where i was seated was so situated that i could hear what the queen said i observed that she was very excited asking the young men of the court to dance with her such as m lamet whose family had been overwhelmed with kindness by the queen and others who all refused so that many of the dances had to be given up the conduct of these gentlemen seemed to me exceedingly improper somehow their refusal likened a sort of revolt the prelude to revolts of a more serious kind the revolution was drawing near it was in fact to burst out before long with the exception of the comte d'artois whose portrait i never did i successively painted the whole royal family the royal children monsieur the king's brother afterward louis the eighteenth madame royale the comtesse d'artois madame elizabeth the features of this last-named princess were not regular but her face expressed gentle affability and the freshness of her complexion was remarkable altogether she had the charm of a pretty shepherdess she was an angel of goodness many a time have i been a witness to her deeds of charity on behalf of the poor all the virtues were in her heart she was indulgent modest compassionate devoted in the revolution she displayed heroic courage she was seen going forward to meet the cannibals who had come to murder the queen saying they will mistake me for her the portrait i made of monsieur favored me with the occasion to become acquainted with a prince whose wit and learning one could extol without flattery it was impossible not to find pleasure in the conversation of louis the eighteenth who talked on all subjects with equal degrees of taste and understanding however for the sake of variety no doubt at some of our sittings he would sing to me and he would sing such common songs that i was unable to understand how these trivial things had ever reached the court he sang more out of tune than any one in the whole world how do you think i sing he asked me one day like a prince your highness was my reply the marquis de montesquieu equerry in chief to monsieur 
would send me a fine carriage and six to bring me to versailles and take me back with my mother who accompanied me at my request all along the road people stood at the windows to see me pass and everyone took their hats off this homage rendered to six horses and an outrider amused me for on returning to paris i got into a cab and nobody took the slightest notice of me about this time i also painted the princess de lamballe without being actually pretty she appeared so at a little distance she had small features complexion of dazzling freshness superb blonde locks and was generally elegant in person the unhappy end of this unfortunate princess is sufficiently well known and so is the devotion to which she fell a victim for in seventeen ninety three when she was at turin entirely out of harm's way she returned to france upon learning that the queen was in danger end of chapter two recording by james k white chula vista chapter three of memoirs of madame vichy lebrun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista memoirs of madame vigy lebrun by elizabeth louise vigy lebrun translated by lionel strachey chapter three work and pleasure in seventeen eighty two monsieur lebrun took me to flanders whither he was called by affairs of business a sale was then being held in brussels of a splendid collection of pictures belonging to prince charles and we went to view it i found there several ladies of the court who met me with great kindness among them the princess d'aremberg whom i had frequently seen in paris but the acquaintance upon which i congratulated myself most was that of the prince de ligny whom i had not known before and who has left an historic reputation for wit and hospitality he invited us to visit his gallery where i admired various masterpieces especially portraits by van dyck and heads by rubens for he owned but few italian pictures he was also good enough to receive us at his magnificent house at belloy i remember that he made us ascend to an outlook built on the top of a hill commanding the whole of his estate and the whole of the country round about the perfect air we breathed up there together with the delightful view was something enchanting what was best of all in this lovely place was the greetings of the master of the house who for his graceful mind and manners never had an equal the town of brussels seemed to me prosperous and lively in high society for instance people were so wrapped up in pleasure-seeking that several friends of the prince de ligny sometimes left brussels at noon arriving at the opera in paris just in time to see the curtain go up and when the performance was over returned to brussels travelling all night that is what i call being fond of the opera we quitted brussels to go to holland i was very much pleased with sardom and maastricht these two little towns are so clean and so very well kept that one envies the lot of the inhabitants the streets being very narrow and provided with canals one does not ride in carriages but on horseback and small boats are used for the transportation of merchandise the houses which are very low have two doors the birth door and the death door through which one only passes in a coffin the roofs of these houses shine as if they were of burnished steel and everything is so scrupulously clean that i remember seeing outside a blacksmith's shop a sort of lamp hanging up which was gilded and polished as though intended for a lady's chamber the women of the people in this part of holland seemed to me very handsome but were so timid that the sight of a stranger made them run away at once i suppose however that the presence of the french in their country may have tamed them we finally visited amsterdam and there i saw in the town hall the magnificent painting by van loo representing the assembled aldermen i do not believe that in the whole realm of painting there is anything finer anything truer it is nature itself 
the aldermen are dressed in black faces hands draping all done inimitably these men are alive you think you are with them i persuaded myself that this picture must be the most perfect of its kind i could not tear myself away from it and the impression it made on me was strong enough to make it ever present in my mind we returned to flanders to see the masterpieces of rubens they were hung much more advantageously than they have been since in paris for they all produce a wonderful effect in those flemish churches other works by the same master adorn some private galleries in one of them at antwerp i found the famous straw hat which has lately been sold to an englishman for a large sum this admirable picture represents a woman by rubens it delighted and inspired me to such a degree that i made a portrait of myself at brussels striving to obtain the same effects i painted myself with a straw hat on my head a feather and a garland of wild flowers holding my palette in my hand and when the portrait was exhibited at the salon i feel free to confess that it added considerably to my reputation the celebrated muller made an engraving after it but it must be understood that the dark shadows of an engraving spoiled the whole effect of such a picture soon after my return from flanders the portrait i had mentioned and several other works of mine were the cause of joseph vernet's decision to propose me as a member of the royal academy of painting monsieur pierre then first painter to the king made strong opposition not wishing he said that women should be admitted although madame vallier coster who painted flowers beautifully had already been admitted and i think madame bien had been too monsieur pierre a very mediocre painter was a clever man besides he was rich and this enabled him to entertain artists luxuriously artists were not so well off in those days as they are now his opposition might have become fatal to me if all true picture lovers had not been associated with the academy and if they had not formed a cabal in my favor against monsieur pierre's at last i was admitted and presented my picture peace bringing back plenty i continued to paint furiously sometimes taking three sittings in the course of a single day after dinner sittings which fatigued me extremely brought about a disorder of my stomach so that i could digest nothing and became wretchedly thin my friends made me consult a doctor who ordered me to sleep every day after dinner at first it was some trouble to me to follow this habit but by remaining in my room with the blinds down i gradually succeeded i am persuaded that i owe my life to this rule all i regret about that enforced rest is that it deprived me for good and all of the amusement of dining in town and as i devoted the whole morning to painting i never was able to see my friends until the evening then it is true none of the pleasures of society were closed to me for i spent my evenings in the politest and most accomplished circles after my marriage i still lived in the rue de clary where m lebrun had large richly furnished apartments and kept his pictures by all the great masters as for myself i was reduced to occupying a small anteroom and a bedroom which also served for my drawing-room this was unpretentiously papered and furnished and there i received my visitors from town and court everyone was eager to come to my evening parties which were sometimes so crowded that marshals of france sat on the floor for want of chairs i remember that the marshal de noyer who was very stout and very old one evening had the greatest difficulty in getting up again i was fond of flattering myself of course that all these grand people came for my sake but as it always was in open houses some came to see the others and most of them to enjoy the best music to be heard in paris such famous composers as gretry sacchini and martini often played pieces from their operas at my house before the first performance our usual singers were garat asvedo riker and madame Todi my sister-in-law who had a very fine voice and could sing anything at sight was very useful to us sometimes i sang myself but without much method i confess garat may perhaps be mentioned as the most extraordinary virtuoso who ever lived 
not only did no difficulties exist for his flexible throat but as to expression he had no rival and i think that no one has ever sung gluck as well as he for instrumental music i had as a violinist viotti whose playing so full of grace of force and expression was ravishing i also had jarnovic maestrino and prince henry of prussia an excellent amateur who brought his first violinist besides salentin played the hautboy holmandel and kramer the piano madame de montgoreau came once soon after her marriage although she was very young then she nevertheless astonished my friends who were very hard to please by her admirable execution and especially by her expression she really made the instrument speak madame montgoreau has since taken first rank as a pianist and distinguished herself as a composer at the time i gave my concerts people had taste and leisure for amusement and even some years later the love of music was so general that it occasioned a serious quarrel between those who were called glucists and piccinists all amateurs were divided into two opposing factions the usual field of battle was the garden of the palais royal there the partisans of gluck and the partisans of piccini went at each other with such violence that there was more than one duel to record the women who were usually present comprised the marquis de Grallier, madame de verdun the marquis de sabran who afterward married the chevalier de Boufflers, madame le couture du molay my best friends all four of them the marquis de rouget madame de pezet her friend whom i painted in the same picture with her and a host of other french ladies whom owing to the smallness of my rooms i could receive but rarely and all sorts of distinguished foreign ladies as for men the list would be too long to write down from this crowd i selected the cleverest for invitation to my suppers which the abbe de lille the poet lebrun the chevalier de Boufflers, the vicomte de segur and others contributed to make the most entertaining in paris he can form no opinion of what society once was in france who has not seen the time when all of the day's business absolved a dozen or fifteen delightful people met at the house of a hostess to finish their evening the ease and the refined merriment which reigned at these light evening repasts gave them a charm which dinners can never have a sort of confidence and intimacy prevailed among the guests it was by such suppers that the good society of paris showed its superiority to that of all europe at my house for instance we met at about nine o'clock no one ever talked politics but we chatted about literature and told anecdotes of the hour sometimes we diverted ourselves by acting charades and sometimes the abbe de lille or the poet lebrun read us some of their compositions at ten o'clock we sat down to table my suppers were of the simplest they always consisted of some fowl a fish a dish of vegetables and a salad so that if i succumbed to the temptation of keeping back some visitors there really was nothing more for anyone to eat but that mattered little the hours passed like minutes and at midnight the company broke up i not only gave suppers at my own house but frequently supped in town sometimes there was dancing and there was no crowding to suffocation as there is nowadays eight persons only performed the square dances and the women who were not dancing could at least look on for the men stood behind them i often went to spend the evening at monsieur de rivier's in charge of the saxon legation a man distinguished as much by his wit as by his good qualities we played comedies there and comic operas his daughter my sister-in-law sang excellently and could pass for a good society actress monsieur de rivier's eldest son was charming in comic parts and i was given the use of a few professionals in opera and drama madame lorette some years retired from the stage did not disdain our troupe she played with us in several operas and her voice was still fresh and fine my brother Viget played leading parts with very great success in short all our actors were good excepting talma 
my saying this will no doubt make my readers laugh the fact is that talma who acted lovers parts with us was so awkward and diffident that no one could then possibly have foreseen how great an actor he would become my surprise was therefore very great when i saw our leading man surpass la rive and take the place of lacane but the time it took to operate this change and all of the same kind proves to me that the dramatic talent takes longer to reach perfection than any other one evening when i had invited a dozen or more friends to hear a recital by the poet lebrun and while we were waiting for them my brother read aloud to me a few pages of anacarsis arriving at the place where in the description of a greek dinner the method of preparing various sauces is explained we ought said my brother to try this to-night i at once ordered up my cook and instructed her properly deciding that she was to make a certain sauce for the chicken and another for the eel as i was expecting some very pretty women i conceived the idea of greek costumes in order to give m de boudray and m boutin a surprise knowing they would not arrive until ten o'clock my studio full of things i used for draping my models would furnish me with enough material for garments and the comte de parois who lived in my house in the rue de clary owned a superb collection of etruscan pottery it happened that he came to see me that evening i confided my project to him so that he supplied me with a number of drinking cups and vases from among which i took my choice i cleaned all these articles myself and arranged them on a table of mahogany without a tablecloth this done i put behind the chairs a large screen which i took the precaution of concealing under some hangings looped up at intervals as may be seen in poussin's pictures a hanging lamp threw a strong light on the table all was now prepared except my costumes when joseph vernet's daughter the charming madame chalgrin was first to arrive i immediately took her in hand doing her hair and dressing her up then came madame de bonille so remarkable for her beauty and madame vigie my sister-in-law who without being pretty had the most beautiful eyes imaginable and there they were all three metamorphosed into veritable athenians lebrun came in we wiped off his powder undid his side curls and put a wreath of laurels on his head then the marquis de cubier arrived while we sent for a guitar of his which he had turned into a gilded lyre i attended to his costume and then likewise dressed up monsieur de riviere and chaudet the famous sculptor the hour was waxing late i had little time to think of myself but as i always wore white gowns in the form of a tunic now called a blouse it was sufficient to put a veil and a wreath of flowers on my head i took particular pains in costuming my daughter darling child that she was and mademoiselle de bonil now madame renaud d'angly who was as lovely as an angel both were ravishing to behold bearing a very light antique vase in readiness to serve us with drink at half past nine the preparations were ended and at ten we heard the carriage of the comte de boudray and of bouton roll in and when these two gentlemen arrived before the door of the dining-room whose two leaves i had thrown open they found us singing gluck's chorus the god of paphos with m de cuvier accompanying us on his lyre never in all my days have i seen two such astonished faces as those of m de boudray and his companion they were so surprised and delighted that they stood motionless for a long time before they could make up their minds to take the seats we had reserved for them besides the two courses i have mentioned we had for supper a cake made with honey and corinth raisins and two dishes of vegetables i confess that that evening we drank a bottle of old cypress wine which had been presented to me but that was the whole of our dissipation we nevertheless remained a long time at table where lebrun recited to us several odes of anacreon which he had translated and i think i never spent a more amusing evening m bouton and m vaudray were so enthusiastic that the next day they told all their friends about the entertainment some of the women of the court asked me to repeat the performance 
I declined for various reasons, and some of them felt hurt by my refusal. Soon the report spread in society that this supper had cost me twenty thousand francs. The king spoke of it with annoyance to the Marquis de Cubier, who fortunately had been one of my guests, and who therefore was able to convince His Majesty how foolish the accusation was. Nevertheless, what was estimated at Versailles at the modest price of twenty thousand francs was increased at Rome to forty thousand. At Vienna, the Baroness de Stroganoff informed me that I had spent 60,000 francs on my Greek supper. At St. Petersburg, the sum fixed upon was 80,000 francs. In reality, the supper had occasioned an outlay of nearly 15 francs. Although, as I am sure, I was the most harmless creature who ever drew breath, I had enemies. A few years before the Revolution, I did the portrait of Monsieur de Colomb, which I exhibited at the Salon of 1785. I painted that minister in a sitting position, and as far as the knees, which caused Mademoiselle Arnaud to say, when she looked at it, Madame Lebrun cut off his legs, so that he should not get away. Unfortunately, this little witticism was not the only one my picture evoked. I was made the butt of calumnies of the most odious description. There were a thousand stories circulated as to the payment of the portrait some asserting that the minister had given me a quantity of sweetmeats wrapped in banknotes, others that I had received in a pasty sum large enough to ruin the treasury. The fact is that Monsieur de Cologne had sent me four thousand francs in a box worth twenty louis. Some of the people who were with me when the box arrived can certify this. They were even surprised at the smallness of the amount, for not long before Monsieur de Bouzot, whom I had painted in the same style, had sent me eight thousand francs, without anyone considering this fee too large. I cared so little about money that I scarcely knew the value of it. The Comtesse de la Guichet, who is still alive, can affirm that, upon coming to me to have her portrait painted, and telling me that she could afford no more than a thousand francs, I answered that Monsieur Lebrun wished me to do none for less than two thousand. My closest friends all know that Monsieur Lebrun took all the money I earned on the plea of investing it in his business. I often had no more than six francs in my pocket and in the world. When in 1788 I painted the picture of the handsome Prince Lubomirskia, who was then grown up, his aunt, the Princess Lubomirskia, remitted 12,000 francs to me, out of which I begged Monsieur Lebrun to let me keep 40. But he would not let me have even that, alleging that he needed the whole sum to liquidate a promissory note. My indifference to money, no doubt, proceeded from the fact that wealth was not necessary to me. Since that which made my house pleasant required no extravagance, I always lived very economically. I spent very little on dress. I was even reproached for neglecting it, for I wore none but white dresses of muslin or lawn, and never wore elaborate gowns excepting for my sittings at Versailles. My headdress cost me nothing, because I did my hair myself and most of the time I wore a muslin cap on my head, as may be seen from my portraits. One of my favorite distractions was going to the play, and I can vow that so many talented actors were on the Paris stage that many of them have had no successors. I remember perfectly having seen the renowned Lacane act, whose ugliness, monstrous as it was, was not apparent in all his parts. But when he played the role of Urusman, in which I once saw him, I was very near the stage, and his turban made him so hideous that although I admired his fine bearing, he frightened me. Mademoiselle Dumenil, although she was short and very ugly, sent her audiences into transports in her great tragic roles. It sometimes happened that Mademoiselle Dumenil acted through a portion of the play without producing any impression. Then all of a sudden she would change. Her gestures, her voice, and her features all became so intensely tragic that she brought down the house. I was assured that before coming on the stage she was in the habit of drinking a bottle of wine, and that another was held in reserve for her in the wings. The most brilliant first appearance I can remember was Mademoiselle Rucourt's and the part of Dido, when she was eighteen or twenty at the most. The beauty of her face, her figure, her voice, her declamation, Everything foreshadowed a perfect actress. 
to so many advantages she added an air of remarkable decency and a reputation of severe morals which caused her to be sought after by our great ladies she was presented with jewelry with theatrical costumes and with money for herself and her father who was always with her later on she changed her habits very much talma our last great tragic actor in my opinion surpassed all the others there was genius in his acting it may also be said that he revolutionized the art in the first place through banishing the bombastic and affected style of delivery by his natural sincere elocution and secondly through bringing about an innovation in dress attiring himself like a greek or a roman when he played achilles or brutus for which i was heartily grateful to him talma has one of the finest heads and one of the most mobile countenances imaginable and however impetuous his acting became always kept dignified which seems to me a prime quality in a tragic actor he was a very good man and the best-tempered individual in the world it was his custom to make no fuss in society in order to make him respond it needed something in the conversation which would stir one of his deepest interests and then he was well worth listening to particularly when he talked about his art comedy was perhaps better off still for talent than tragedy i often had the good fortune to see previer on the stage there indeed was the perfect the inimitable artist his acting so clever so natural and so full of fun was at the same time most varied he would play in turn crispin Sossi, and figaro and you would not know it was the same man so inexhaustible were his comic resources dugazon his successor in humorous parts would have been an excellent comedian if a desire to make the public laugh had not often led him into being farcical he played certain parts of valets admirably dugazon behaved villainously in the revolution he was one of those who went for the king to varenne and an eyewitness told me that he had seen him at the carriage door with a gun on his shoulder be it observed that this man had been overwhelmed with favors by the court and especially by the comte d'artois i also witnessed mademoiselle contat's first appearance she was extremely pretty and well made but did her work so badly at first that no one foresaw what a fine actress she was to become her charming face was not sufficient to protect her from hisses when she played the part confided to her by beaumarchais of susanna in the marriage of figaro but from that moment on she advanced further and further on the path of success at a period when all of the great actors were beginning to age a young talent arose that to-day is the ornament of the french stage mademoiselle marma was then playing the parts of young girls in the most highly accomplished manner she excelled in that of victorine in the unwitting philosopher and in a dozen others in which she never had an equal for it was impossible for anyone else to be so true to life and so affecting it was nature at its best fortunately that face that figure that bewitching voice are so perfectly preserved that mademoiselle marma has no age nor i believe ever will have and the public proves every night by its applause that it shares my opinion i remember having seen sophie arnaud twice at the opera in castor and pollux i recollect that she seemed to me to possess grace and feeling as for her abilities as a singer the music of that epoch disgusted me so that i did not listen to it enough to be able to speak about it now mademoiselle arnaud was not pretty her mouth spoiled her face only her eyes conveyed the cleverness which made her famous a great number of her witty sayings have been passed round from mouth to mouth or printed a woman whose superior gifts delighted us for a long time was mademoiselle arnaud's successor this was madame saint huberti whom one must have heard in order to understand how far lyric tragedy can go madame saint huberti had not only a superb voice but was also a great actress her good fate ordained that she should sing the operas of piccini sacchini and gluck and all this music so beautiful so expressive exactly suited her talent which was full of significance of sincerity and of nobility 
she was not good-looking but her face was entrancing because of its soulfulness the comte d'entreguet a very fine handsome man and very distinguished through his intellect fell in love with her and married her when the revolution broke out they escaped to london together it was there that one evening they were both murdered without either the murderers or their motives ever being discovered in the ballet likewise noted for people with great capabilities jardel and vestry the elder were first vestry was tall and imposing and was not to be excelled in dances of the grave and sedate order i could not prescribe the grace with which he took off and put back his hat at the bow preceding the minuet all the young women of the court took lessons from him before their presentation in making the three courtesies vestry the elder was succeeded by his son the most astonishing dancer to be seen such were his combined gracefulness and lightness although our dancers of the present day by no means spare us their pirouettes certainly no one could ever do as many as he did he would suddenly rise toward the sky in such a marvelous manner that one thought he must have wings and this made old vestry say if my son touches the ground it is only from politeness to his colleagues mademoiselle gimard had another sort of talent altogether her dancing was only a sketch she did nothing but take short steps but executed them with such fascinating motions that the public awarded her the palm over all other female dancers she was short slight very well shaped and although plain her features were such that at the age of forty-five she looked no more than fifteen when on the stage i now come to one whose entire dramatic career i have been able to follow the best talent the opera comique had to show madame du gazot never had such reality been seen upon the stage the actress disappeared and gave place to the actual babbitt comtesse d'albert or nicolette her voice was rather weak but it was strong enough for laughter for tears for all situations for all parts gretry and de la roche who wrote for her were mad about her no one ever again played nina like her nina so decent and so passionate at once and so unhappy and so touching that the mere sight of her made the audience shed tears madame du gazon was a royalist heart and soul of this she gave the public proof when the revolution was well advanced in playing the part of the maid in unforeseen events the queen was witnessing the performance and in a duet begun by the valet with i love my master dearly madame du gazon whose answer was ah how i love my mistress turned toward the queen's box laid her hand over her heart and sang her reply in a melting voice while she bowed to her majesty i was told that the public and such a public afterward sought revenge by attempting to make her sing some horrible thing which had come into vogue and was often heard in the theatres but madame du gazon would not yield she left the stage end of chapter three recording by james k white chula vista